Kerry. Maybe Kerry could go there. Sure, we, we could always stay there. Always carry a gun. She can go there because we've got I'll a bucket just, here. I'll just move along and you carry the Yeah? Okay. We're moving along for you. Okay, hello, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to start <laughs> on our next session now, if you'd like to take your seats. Oh, hello, David. It is lovely seeing old friends. It is like being at a wedding, this conference, isn't it? Keep on seeing lovely people and then thinking, oh, I haven't written to them for ages. Sorry, David. So, this session is called Brexit State of Play. And, God, we're going to uh, Vicky and myself have just had the pleasure of eating cheese with Michael Gove. So, I'm feeling slightly odd. It was organic, of course, and it was also from Oxfordshire, and it was delicious. But my life is somewhat bizarre sometimes. Anyway, uh, my name is Kath Dalmeni, and I'm the Chief Executive of Sustain, the Alliance for Better Food and Farming. And we're helping to coordinate several sessions in the conference on Brexit-related themes, lucky us. Um, I actually want to be in the sessions on insects and soil and things like that, but this is such an important wave of things that are going on that it feels really important to share it with you. So my job out here over the next hour or so is to help you navigate the elements of Brexit that are relevant to food, farming and fishing. Star, caveat, pretty much all of it, frankly. It's gigantic for food, farming, and fishing. So it, we're going to focus on what has happened, particularly since last year, and the key things that are coming up in 2019. So I hope this will be a really informative session, and I'm really open to you nabbing me after it to say, hang on, what were you talking about on that bit, whatever. This is the stuff we're sadly living and breathing at the moment, but it feels really important that you guys should get a chance to really quiz us about it. So last year, I was up on this stage again, just after Michael Gove, and I hopped about trying to explain the whole of key Brexit policies like the Withdrawal Act with the help of three buckets, which I've now become famous for, uh, and some cartoons of elephants in the room. Um, I won't be doing quite as much of that because I'm very happy instead this year, rather than having to do it on my own, is to be able to navigate this with the support of three people with bucket loads of experience. Bad pun, last pun of the day. Um, so I'd like to introduce Vicky Hurd in the middle, who coordinates the Sustain Alliance's work on sustainable farming policy. My great privilege has been to sit next to Vicky over the last year or so while she handles phone calls on the agriculture bill and trying to help lots and lots of people navigate and understand what it all means and what we can all be doing together to improve it. Here we have Tom Lancaster, who's the Senior Land Use Policy Advisor from the RSPB. We, I hope you won't mind me saying, but we also call you the brain the size of the planet at our office. <laughs> so, <laughs> immersed in emerging government policy on the environment, working as part of the Greener UK Alliance. Lots of people are joining together to try and support each other on key efforts. We also have Kerry McCarthy MP. Thank you very much for grilling Michael Gove earlier. Fresh, I've said in my notes from the previous sessions. You're feeling fresh <laughs> after that experience. Um, uh, and... I just wanted to say that I particularly welcome Kerry because of all the amazing work she's been doing to champion agroecology in Parliament and going across party. So we've invited you here not as a representative of the Labour Party, which of course is your leadership person in that, but as part of that agro ecological movement and taking that truth to power. So we thank you for all your efforts there. So again, anyone who was here from this session last year you'll know that we try and make this as accessible as possible. Most people know a bit about something, but to try and be expert in absolutely everything is really hard, particularly at the moment. It keeps coming at us like a great stream of logs coming down the stream. So we will have a few visual aids thrown in for good measure, but the, if you can't quite see what's written on them, don't worry, I'll explain. Um, and there is a lot to cover. So we'll circulate a summary afterwards via the Sustain website and our email list. So if you want to get on our email list, tell me or we've got a sign-up sheet. I'm not there to market at you. It is simply to share the information, get people involved. Because your voices really are vital. It really is vital that people hear stuff. Michael Gove is in listening mode. He has changed things as a result of people having a go, having a go at him, frankly, sometimes. Uh, if you remember from last year how Jyoti Fernandez took him up on various things. Well, she ended up going into DEFRA and educating some of the DEFRA officials about agroecology and small-scale farming. At this time in history, people are listening, and we must make those voices heard. So if we can facilitate that in any way, we will do so. So 
Uh, and please do jump in if you feel like we've looked anything at any point. So uh, let's start on the actual meat and the sandwich. I didn't go to the vegan event, which or whatever you want to put in your sandwich. Um, last year, I described working on Brexit policy like navigating in a fog. Things hadn't begun to coalesce. It wasn't clear what was happening or who would take leadership on things. There was only talk of various stuff. There were just a few promising initiatives starting to coalesce like shadows in that fog. So I'll just remind you where we were at one year ago to get that together. So as a reminder, last January, ORFC 2018, the EU withdrawal bill, the repeal bill, was in full swing. On agriculture policy, a command paper and public consultation were vaguely promised. They were due sometime in the spring. And the 25-year environment plan and the fisheries bill were due shortly, which they continue to be due shortly for quite a long time. Relationships with key institutions in the European Union and standards processes were unclear. Nothing much has changed there. And a trade bill white paper had been published that pretty much had ignored public consultation because the public consultation had closed pretty much the night before it was then published. So clearly nothing had been listened to. Mm, that sounds a bit familiar too. Um, and our UK Trade Secretary, Liam Fox, was jetting all over the planet, beginning trade discussions with other nations and had very recently opined that eating chlorine chicken wasn't a problem, if you remember. So that was just the November before our last... How much has happened in that year? A lot. Also, a transition deal between the UK and the EU seemed increasingly likely. I'll leave it to you to decide whether or not that is true now. So, I deliberately have a bucket that is marked uncertainty into which we might continue to put in mentally various ideals, including no deals and deals. We've structured this year's session around the main legislation and policies. Of course, there's lots more going on. These aren't the only things that we should all be concerned about, but we are all treating these as the foundation stones for so much that will be to come. So the Agriculture Bill sets some principles, legal principles, and that will be rolled out into the Environmental Land Management Scheme, which will affect how money is paid back to farmers, which will affect how soil is dealt with, which will affect how animal welfare is dealt with in the future. So the reason we put in so much effort now is because we know so that so much will be played out on the basis of that foundation. The reason we've got this ghastly slide, you know when people get trained in PowerPoint, they say never put up too much text. The reason is because that's the only slide. So I just thought I'd bung it all up there and then it's there as a background to us. So let me do, I'm not gonna run through all of these because I'm gonna get my colleagues over here to explain some things as well. But I think that the deal or no deal with the European Union is worth a comment from the start especially given the imminence of the meaningful vote that's supposed to be going to Parliament about that deal. I was expecting to be able to discuss the outcome of that, but of course there was all the shenanigans before Christmas. It can be paralyzing to discuss anything to do with Brexit when we don't know if our farmers and fishers are about to lose the 13.5 billion pound export market that's right on our doorstep. Nor if supply chains are about to be significantly disrupted, nor what standards farmers and fishers will be expected to operate under. US standards, because we've accepted a trade deal. EU standards, because we're staying in some form of common market, single market, whatever thing gets negotiated. In the event, or in the event of a deal or no deal, if there will be any transition period, we think there probably will be. We don't know quite how long that will be. Then there's the transition period for farming into new systems. So lots of uncertainty. And apparent steps that are being taken to mitigate the impact of a no deal have done little to convince me personally and pretty much all the people I talk to that anyone's fully on top of a no deal scenario. Ferries, for example, being hired from people who don't have any boats. Uh, and also, I mean, those ferries costing 100 million pounds, turns out there is a magic money tree after all. Um, but also things about forecasting of lorry tailbacks, plans for hundreds of port to be delivered to motorways down in Dover so the lorry drivers can be relieved. Measures recommended to businesses and all those notices of preparedness that came out that basically said, get a lawyer who can afford a lawyer. They've met pretty much with dismay and shaking heads and I can see lots of shaking heads in the audience. But I mean, I'm basing this on predictions from reputable industry. I'm not a great Ramona or anything, but Michael Gove himself has said that food prices are likely to go up after Brexit. And so has the governor of the Bank of England. So in, in various scenarios, 
And this is all in the context of a huge rise in emergency food banks. So people are already hungry and already struggling to eat well. I'm going to ask us to park all those thoughts. So I could just stand up here and moan, couldn't I, for another hour. But I suggest that most of them are associated with uncertainty at the moment. Hence, I've got an uncertainty bucket around which no deal and deal, that's what's written on these yellow fan of paper, are sitting. Of course, they'll weave themselves into our conversation as we go through, but uncertainties aren't, won't get us very far because we want to talk about the agriculture bill, the environment bill, the fisheries bill, trade policy, where the public money is going, and food policy. So let me introduce the other thing that will be a strand running through the whole of this session, which is the bucket of cash. There is actually some actual real life cash in this, only a few pounds left over from my lunch. Um, and we couldn't afford a double-decker bus to write the money on, sorry about that. Nor, indeed, a magic money tree. So this galvanized bucket for £1.50 will have to do. This represents the money that we will repatriate from European funding programs. So into it, for example, goes supposedly the £3 billion of common agricultural policy money that is currently goes to UK farmers. Here it goes. Plus roughly another £10 billion, which has been repatriated from several other EU funds that barely ever get mentioned, such as ooh, the European Maritime and Fisheries Fund, the European Social Fund, LIDA Plus, the Euro European Regional Development Fund. These figures are wild estimates, by the way. I'm going to put circa on the front, uh, because HM Treasury will no doubt want some of that £3 billion back. They've already said so. Everybody's pretty much assuming that will be less. Also, currency fluctuation rates, you know, lots of different things will happen. So these aren't solid figures, and there will certainly be political pressures over time to reduce those amounts. Hence, you can see, sharp-eyed among you will see there's a hole in this bucket. It's already running out. But there's serious amounts of money to be decided upon. Well, who's, who's deciding that? My colleagues here will be able to comment on some of that money as we go through. And we... <laughs> What concerns me particularly is, yes, on the three billion, there's now an agricultural bill that defi defines public goods, helpful. But for this kind of amounts of money, there isn't any definition of anything. So the roughly 10 billion pounds or so caveat, caveat, that's being brought back by government into this country is going into an anonymous bucket, which is somewhere over here, you can't even see it, called the UK Shared Prosperity Fund with no binding commitment to disperse this fairly, for example, among the devolved nations, nor to areas of deprivation, nor with any sustainability, climate change, biodiversity, social justice, soil, nor anything else signaled as a funding priority. The only criterion we've found mentioned anywhere so far for this very large amount of money is productivity. Okay, so we probably need a new definition of productivity, for which read Vicky Hurd's wonderful blog earlier this year, but at the moment, that narrow version of what productivity is is likely to govern it. And the devolved nations are getting pretty cross about all of that because obviously a lot of money will be lost in the process. So I've done you two buckets so far. What's the other one? Oh, yes. I put a food policy right up there at the back of the stage. Perhaps that's because a national food policy or strategy is still somewhere quite way off, actually. Uh, so from here, I can sort of see you. Um, so on this stage in January 2018, Michael Gove referred to the need for development of a national food policy stroke strategy. And we all went, ooh, that sounds interesting, I'd like to get involved in that. So what's happened since then is a, a nice chap called Henry Dimbleby, who used to run Leon restaurants, and also previously chaired the school food plan, he knows Michael Gove, that's how it works. Um, when Gove was Secretary of State for Education, Henry now sits on the executive board of DEFRA, um, but, however, that food policy remains a very undefined post-Brexit promise. Quite a lot of things are like that at the moment. Uh, I'd also observe that it's also become a rather convenient place to deposit certain issues. Oh, yes, we'll deal with that later. Put it in the bucket marked food strategy. So health, probably, food, skills, standards, fairness, animal welfare labelling. Might go in there, we don't know yet. Um, so that, that's the kind of thing we get back is, oh, that's not for the agriculture bill, or that's not for the fisheries bill, or that's not for the trade bill, don't worry, it can be in the food policy. L later is a scary word for me. And uh, also what happens is when you put it in the bucket mark later and food policy, you don't get fundamental legal principles, legislation, accountability, budget requirements, accountability, people measuring what you're doing. So we're all interested in not letting vital issues slip past in this way. Later isn't good enough, hence, I'm 
the, my colleagues who are working on now, the stuff that has to be won now, and key legislation that really, really seriously affects food farming, fishing, standards, trade, will be set in 2019, and they must be the robust foundations for the future. So, guys who are working on robust foundations for the future, let me come to Vicky. Would you mind doing your bit on the agriculture bill? That would be very helpful. I've, my, uh, Vicky and I have developed some questions. I'll let you get on with them and then maybe prompt some if you haven't covered all of it. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you, Kath. <laughs> um, everybody's looking forward to your bucket session again. <laughs> um, it's a good one. Um, so, very briefly, um, we had a bit of a, um, uh, a run through of the timetable, actually, from Kerry and um, Secretary of State earlier. Um, I mean, one thing I could say, you know, in terms of what's happened this year, DEFRA have listened and they've had their health and harmony consultation, 44,000 responses. I'm not 100% sure the final bill, which was launched in September, um, took account of all the listening. Um, but it was interesting to see the ATMPs that spoke in the House of Commons when it was given its second reading. It was really, I have to say, I was encouraged to see ATMPs talking about farming, even though a lot of it was a bit sort of parrot-like, some of it, but there were some really good interventions. Um, but the next phase um, is, uh, it's been through a committee stage, which Kerry was expertly on, and some good amendments were tabled, and some of those have been tabled and some others have been tabled for a report stage, which is the last chance in this round for members of Parliament, Commons, to um, uh, have their say and vote on amendments that could strengthen the bill in ways that we, many NGOs, many farming um, organisations want to see it strengthen. But then it goes to the House of Lords and then it goes into a stage of what is commonly called ping pong, where it goes to House of Lords and Commons, um, probably finishing in late spring, although everything's moved, so I, it's really hard to tell now. Now we understand the report stage is um, for the bill is uh, late January. Every, everything's moved um, somewhat um, by the meaningful vote. Um, but, you know, it's worth mo noting that or throughout this process so far, George Eustace, who is actually the minister in charge of the bill, has been rock-like in his determination to not have any amendments apart from his own amendments. Um, a lot of amendments are being tabled, there were probing ones, but they, they, he's been trying to be very reassuring, as has the Secretary of State, that everything that they say will happen, will happen. Everything we want, you know, lots of it will happen. You know, if you want pasture-fed livestock, it will be supported through the bill. You know, everything you say, you get this reassurance. The, and so it, it's quite interesting, it's rock-like in that. Um, what kind of things does it actually include, though, as opposed to what we're being told it's include? I mean, one of the main things that it, it provides a transition phase out of the common agricultural policy, the European common agricultural policy, which currently supports and regulates farming across Europe in a way to, to not allow distortion of trade across the European single market. And that transition is, is effectively sort of nine years. I can't go, I haven't got time to go into the huge amount of detail. Um, but it's till sort of 20, um, 2027, we'll have this transition phase. And that's sort of the bill allows for that. One of the big things that you're all aware of is that it um, allows over seven years the development of a new scheme called the Environmental Land Management Scheme, um, which will support farmers and land managers for delivering public goods. So it's a whole new way of supporting farming so that the farmer um, is a contractor to the public for goods. And those goods are listed in the bill. There's a, there's a long list which um, uh, includes um, I'll oh, top of my head. My head's gone blank. Climate change, um, mitigation, climate mitigation, animal welfare, landscapes, um, natural capital kind of um, things, and environmental protection. Tied in and increasingly tied in through a process which DEFRA is developing now on indicators to the 25 year environment plan, which was launched by Theresa May earlier this year. And those indicators and targets in the 25 year plan, which Tom, will, I'm sure, will talk about, are very. Um, uh, uh, you know, potentially very detailed and precise, and how that ties in with the environmental land management scheme, which is supposed to be much easier, less complex, simple to do, farmer-led. It'd be quite interesting to see how those two um, coincide. But just to finish what else is in the bill, new powers to um, have data collection within the food system um, to allow more transparency 
farmers to, to, to get more power within the food system. It also allows um, government to intervene when there are exceptional market conditions, like a massive crash in global prices or a massive climate disaster. They can intervene. It also covers things like marketing standards and producer organizations. Um, and measures to increase productivity in um, uh, areas like that. Um, but it also, crucially, and very, we're very pleased to see a big clause in there about fair dealing in the supply chain. We've been campaigning for decades, to, and, and many others have as well, to get the supply chain regulated so it gives a, um, a fairer deal to farmers and growers here and overseas. And it was very good to see the, the clause in the bill about fair dealing. But at the moment, it's too weak. Um, so, you know, th but we are going to be working hard to amend it um, and so that it actually is stronger, that it's not just an option to do a regulation so you'd have statutory codes for the different farming sectors um, so that they could, those suppliers buying directly from farmers would have to comply with codes about how they treat the farmer don't do unfair contract um, arrangements, don't pay late, don't all, do all sorts of things which undermine a farmer and grower's ability to actually run a business, which is one of the reasons we get lots of food waste, one of the reasons farmers go under, one of the reasons they can't actually make a, a, a good business. Um, so we want to strengthen that, that clause. Um, but other gaps and problems within um, in the bill, um, I, I don't know if anybody here was at our session at nine o'clock this morning, but I was talking about the bill being um, an empty vessel because, and it was also touched on by Kerry and, and um, Michael Govolia about the fact that it's an enabling bill. It's got a lot of powers. The government can do a lot of things if it wants to. But if it chooses not to, it doesn't have to. Um, and so it very much is down to what the Secretary of State wants to do, what he can get money to do or she can get money to do. Um, and that brings me on to the second big gap. There isn't really an adequate mechanism to draw down a sufficient budget or an analysis of what budget is needed to deliver on the public goods that you have decided you want to buy from farmers. So there's a you know, multi-annual budget mechanism is what a lot of the amendments that are being proposed now are about. Really need to know how we're going to be securing money so that farmers have the security of knowing that they can invest in different farming systems, different um, equipment, for instance, on farm, um, growing trees, things like that. Anyway, so you need that multi-annual budget. There's also no reference to health, human health. No, um, there's reference to animal health and plant health, but not human health. And given that the Secretary of State, when he came and spoke at a sustain event, agreed with me about four times, was it, Kath? that public health was important, and he said it this morning as well, and yet says, oh no, it's, then it's about the market and everything, whereas there's so many ways in which we could be contributing to a public health agenda and outcomes, specific outcomes like obesity, like getting people meat, eating more fruit and fresh fruit and veg, higher nutritional content of food, reduced pesticides, reducing antibiotic use, and loads of health outcomes we could be delivering on through the kind of schemes in the, in the bill. Anyway, I'm probably going on too long, but agroecological systems as well, absolutely crucial that we get a really specific um, tool to support systems which are whole farm um, uh, systems that deliver multiple outcomes, um, as was discussed this morning, absolutely vital. Other big gaps, new entrants, local food supply, local food chains, research and development, workers not, not covered in there at all. Why aren't workers getting the proper protection they need? They're absolutely crucial assets for farming, and yet they've had their um, means of having a decent pay and work um, conditions taken away in 2013. They've got nothing now, so um, that, that's been neglected. Um, so, Kat asked me to say a bit about the three billion, that, that three billion in, in your budget. Um, it's under huge pressure. Um, most stakeholders, though, are agreed that we need to keep that three billion modelling by RSPB, maybe you'll talk about it, um, Tom, um, suggests just for our statutory obligations to maintain the kind of nature, environmental protection obligations, we need to have at least, was it 2 billion? 2.3. 2.3 billion. And that's not loads of other things that really need to come from our um, farm policy. Um, and so, yet many people are speculating um, how we will be able to convince the Treasury, the treasury um, of the need to pay for those 
statutory or you know specific things that we already have now but all the other things that we need to do I mean you know a lot of our rivers aren't in good condition now so we need to actually be doing more to ensure farmers can actually invest in systems which protect our rivers um, how to pay for these outcomes so there's much talk about that um, there's also much talk about getting private companies to pay for these things and that worries me I must be honest that worries me because it lets Treasury it lets the public off the hook um, do how comfortable do we feel about Nestle paying for water protection instead of us as a, as a community say where, wherever it is that might be the right outcome but it should be under a framework of public um, control I'd, I'd have thought but there's you know this discussion we had but also if we talk about public money paying for public private money paying for public goods who then owns those public goods I mean diff difficult things here and, and you know I think we need to be very careful we don't let the Treasury off the hook um, and we need to support um, Secretary of State in demanding the level of um, budget required um, and who will receive the money um, uh, ultimately where, where it will go um, will it go to big landowners will it go to park, park keepers um, it's such an essential part of many farmers' incomes now. Um, when, if it's taken away, when it's taken away, eventually, um, there needs to be something in place to make sure farmers just don't um, disappear. Um, but so that transition is absolutely crucial to get right. Um, so, in terms of finally, just the opportunity to influence. Um, right now, it's talk, meet, phone, badger your MP in advance, and including Kerry, um, <laughs> if she doesn't really need it, um, in advance of the report stage, which we heard this, this afternoon would be around late January. Anything you can do, RSPB, Sustain, Soil Association, we've all got e-actions that you can take. If you can personalise those or write them by hand, even better. Meet with your MP, take them on the farm, tell them why you think there needs to be a strength in the bill in any way you want. Um, but we've got lots of ideas, obviously. But really do that in the next few weeks, because that's the last chance. After that, do you know any lords? Do you know any uh, ladies? Do you know any baronesses? Um, we had a very good meeting in the, in the House of Lords last, at the end of last year with some peers. It was very interesting to hear their thoughts on the um, Agriculture Bill. They've already indicated, officially, and in, uh, you know, we can read about it, that they're really unhappy that the bill actually allows the Secretary of State to do whatever they want. It's not, it's a, the enabling nature of the bill um, is very worrying to them because they want it to be more clear what is going to be done, how to make um, the department accountable for outcomes. And so they're, they're going to come down hard on the legislative side, the demo democratic side of the bill where it's weak. Um, but the more you can, we can influence the House of Lords, the better. And we'll be trying to do that, but it's obviously a lot harder. I don't know that many Lords, I have to say. Um, but after all this, is, after the bill has actually been published, and then, you know, then it comes back to MPs, so keep talking to MPs. Ultimately, there will be a lot of secondary legislation, and there are possibly opportunities to influence that, um, and uh, lobbying opportunities. So, um, I think that's probably, you know, it's a huge change. You know, what we're seeing is the first agricultural bill in 50 years. We should have a big say. I was slightly worried this morning when we asked for a show of hands how many people in the room, there's a packed room downstairs on the Health and Harmony consultation. There weren't that many people that put their hands up. And I, you know, I think this is your opportunity to really have your say in the nature of farm support for the next 10, 20, 30 years. So if, if the OFRC folk don't say, who, who will? They got 44,000 con consultation responses, but a lot of those were e-actions. So the more personal we can get, the better. Um, I also finally was asked to say something about a no-deal scenario, which is quite, quite tricky. We'll probably still get a bill, um, because we'll need our own means of supporting farming, but I suspect the development of that bill will be delayed, and the development of the Environmental Land Management Scheme, which is very much under development now, it's, it's gone to tests and trials, which means they're testing out ways that it can work and ways that it can't work with farming groups, with conservation groups, with land managers. They're doing tests now, and they'll go to full pilot in a year's time. But those, those will all be delayed, probably, because the no deal, we know, will be pretty catastrophic. If we actually don't leave the European Union, so we know no leave, um, that scenario brings us right back to the common agricultural policy. So we'll have to very quickly, <laughs> 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 <laughs>
very quickly, well, yeah, I haven't talked about Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, which have their own processes, absolutely <laughs> should have mentioned them. Pete, thank you for that. Um, all their processes of consultation on their own um, national um, farm policies. But if we don't leave, we'll go back to the common agricultural policy, which is going on, undergoing a reform right now. So we will not have much chance to influence that reform because it will already been more or less passed. Um, but that new common agricultural policy will be implemented in the UK if, if we don't leave. Um, and the way the reforms seem to be going, I'm not following them as closely as I would like, um, they're going slightly in the right direction, but nothing like as revolutionary as our agricultural bill in terms of paying for public goods. There's a lot of talk, and some of it might be good, but anyway, I, I'm not sure how likely uh, not leaving is, so probably more likely no deal, sadly, so we need to keep on at our parliamentarians. Sorry, is that, is that okay? That is brilliant. Any other questions? Thank you. No, uh, you've covered everything beautifully. Thank you very much okay. indeed. As you can see, it's so much depth even in one subject. So this is meant to be an ice skate across a lot of different subjects to give you a sense of where we're at, but also to help you then shape what you want to grill us on in the future. So now can I come to you, Tom, and say last January in 2018, we were looking forward to publication of the 25-year environment plan. An environment bill was being mooted as well as the need for an environmental watchdog with or without teeth uh, to hold government to account when the UK's links with the European Court of Justice, for example, are severed. So can you share with us your thoughts on the same sort of questions as Vicky? Yep. Um, so there's definitely some people in the audience who know this stuff better than me, so do holler if I get anything wrong, because um, agriculture is my day-to-day -day rather than sort of environmental governance issues. But... I'll just start briefly by setting out the issue because actually some of they, even the issue itself is quite impenetrable, let alone following progress on the issue. Um, so the European institutions and, and the European sort of legislative framework provides the entire framework for environmental legislation, uh, both in terms of um, the rules that we follow and then how those rules are enforced. Um, so we have been focused on three broad areas in our advocacy around the environmental sort of legislative framework. So there's this idea of the governance gap. So even with the Withdrawal Act, which basically copies and pastes a lot of that environmental law into UK law, even with that Withdrawal Act, you lose the governance provided by the European institutions, particularly the European Commission and the European Court of Justice. So the European Commission has sweeping powers to enforce EU law and hold governments and public bodies to account. Uh, they can levy fines, start processes called infraction processes, which can lead to unlimited fines for unlimited periods of time until the situation is resolved. And the European Court of Justice can require routes to remedy, so they can require that problems, environmental issues, are remedied by the government or public authority and anyone, any citizen, any one of you can take a complaint to the European Commission and they will take it up if they think it's merited. So none of that would exist even with the Withdrawal Act. So that's a huge governance gap is what it's, is what it's called. Mm -hmm. The second issue is around principles. So you've got the Plu to Pays principle, the precautionary principle in European law. None of those exist in UK law. At least they're not operable in UK law. Uh, and the third issue that we've been pushing around, and this is really where we're trying to build beyond where EU law goes currently, is around targets. So there are some targets in EU law, such as uh, a target in the Water Framework Directive to meet good ecological status for all water bodies by 2027, which the UK is nowhere near meeting. Um, there are targets around favourable conservation status for birds and habitats directives and things like that. But what we're pushing for is a much more comprehensive suite of targets across a whole load of environmental issues. So those are the three things we're calling for. Uh, in terms of progress against each of those, there has been some progress made over the last year. It has probably been like getting blood out of a stone. <laughs> so the 25-year environment plan was published in January. There was some good ambition there, um, but it was really just that. It was ambition, it was a strategy. It had no legislative underpinning at all. Um, there was then the Withdrawal Act. Um, or rather government committed to uh, an environmental principles and governance bill to address some of those principles and governance issues and the consultation on that was published in May and that was very weak. So in particular the governance arrangements, the strongest uh, enforcement action a new governance body could take against the government 
was to issue advisory notices only. So it was literally a letter sent to government saying, you're not doing this very well, and the government could have just turned around and said, thanks, we know, go away. Um, during that consultation, the Withdrawal Act was passed, and environmental NGOs and others managed to get an amendment passed to the Withdrawal Act, which then required government uh, to bring forward proposals for a new governance body and a policy statement on environmental principles that actually went much further than the current open consultation. So it was a very weird process whereby newly passed law overtook currently um, open consultations. So that was last summer. And then just before Christmas, the Environmental Principles and Governance Bill was published. I think it's fair to say it's a mixed bag. Um, so on principles, it's weak. They're on the face of the bill. Um, but there is no overarching duty. Uh, there are huge get-outs. So just reading from my colleagues, very useful briefing here. Um, there are get-outs in the bill, which mean that the statement, so the policy statement, which would give effect to the principles in law, um, does not need to deal with policies related to taxation, spending, the allocation of resources, and any other matters specified in regulations by the Secretary of State. So, effectively, as written at the moment, all environmental principles, as they apply to policy making in the UK, could be disregarded. Um, so that's a big area that we will look to improve uh, as the bill under, as undergoes pre-legislative scrutiny. Um, on governance, the Office for Environmental Protection is stronger, so that's the name of the new governance body, uh, is stronger than we expected it to be or feared it might be. Um, so for example, its remit will cover all public bodies, so Natural England, for example, not just DEFRA and core government departments. Um, but there's still lots of concerns about its independence. Um, uh, for example, it can't levy fines in the way that the European Commission can. Um, and its budget and its uh, executive body is appointed by the Secretary of State. So although it reports to Parliament, it's still very much at risk of being uh, hobbled in the way that a lot of other environmental organisations have been hobbled by DEFRA to date. Um, interestingly, the withdrawal agreement, which is another thing that may happen or, or may not happen on the 14th of this month, um, actually specifies level playing field provisions in the backstop, which go much further than even these proposals on governance. So it's a constantly moving and evolving situation. Um, and this is this Environmental Principles and Governance Act is a draft bill that's been subject to pre-legislative scrutiny. So there is an opportunity now to push for much bigger improvements. So we, we've seen the colour of DEFRA's money, if you like, and we can now push for much bigger improvements, particularly in the context of the withdrawal agreement if that's passed. And on targets, there is very really, there is not, not really anything in the bill on targets. Um, so that is the one area, to be honest, it's not something which they committed to and they're not committed to doing it in the Withdra Withdrawal Act. But on targets, that's what we see as absolutely central to the future of um, an effective environmental policy framework, including agriculture policies and environmental land management schemes, because all of these are really relevant to the future of agriculture, the future of farming, in that there's a lot of talk about how you can guarantee funding for future policies. To me, the best way to guarantee that is not necessarily a clause in the Agriculture Bill, although we will be pushing for that. The best guarantee for, push, for, for investment into environmental and management scheme, at least, is to have legally binding targets, similar to the Climate Change Act target, um, which then drive investment in an agriculture policy and a fisheries policy and other sectoral policies into the environment, enabling farmers and fishers and everyone else to improve the natural environment for the next generation, which is the government's big commitment. And then you have a strong independence governance body to hold government to account in terms of whether or not those policies are working and contributing toward, toward those targets, and you get a virtuous circle going. And that's the sort of dream, if you like. That's what we're pushing for, and that's how this all knits together. And the principles are obviously relevant as well because you've got things like the precautionary principle that are hugely relevant to the regulation of pesticides and other chemicals, the pollute to pays principle which is relevant to agriculture's impact on the water environment, for example. So all of this does knit together. Um, in terms of the funding, I think, you know, we probably do need the three billion. As Vicky said, we've done some work to quantify just what environmental objectives would need, and it's about 2.3 billion, and it probably is much more than that. Um, 
the other EU funds that you talked about, Kath, you know, the European Regional Development Fund has actually been really important in funding green infrastructure, particularly in urban areas. So Old Moor, which is a big RSPV reserve in Rotherham, used to be the most polluted place in Western Europe. I think only um, didn't get the whole European crown because of somewhere in the Urals. Uh, mm -hmm. That was created by, because they needed topsoil to cap some railway sidings from a coal, uh, big coal mining area. And that now brings in 100,000 people, huge benefits to the local economy. So we'll be pushing for the Shared Prosperity Fund to include similar investments in green infrastructure. But our concern at the moment is that that is far too narrowly focused on productivity and a very narrow definition of productivity. Um, and if there's no deal, uh, well, Green UK has produced a briefing on the withdrawal agreement, which is on Green UK's website. It sets out sort of what we think about the current status quo, uh, the withdrawal agreement, and no deal against what we've set out as four green benchmarks on enforcement, standards, cooperation, and trade. So I'd go away and read that. And That's brilliant. Actually, I'll, st I'll stop you there because yeah. I think I will thoroughly recommend briefings both by Vicky and by Green UK being really clear summaries of things that are going on. I'm going to just very, very briefly do the fisheries bill. This is a farming conference, so not directly relevant, but it's part of this whole scene. So, and my colleague who works on fisheries is here in the audience, Ruth. So she's fantastic on this. So apologies if I miss anything off, Ruth. But it gives powers to make future legislation, and actually that's about it. Uh, um, well, Vicky said that the agriculture bill is like an empty vessel, this is like an empty fishing vessel. Um, it's kind of a neat swerve away from the big controversial issues that will bring Nigel Farage or Belp Geldof up the, up the Thames on a fishing boat. So it fails to afford fishermen the same protection under the tra fair trading obligation. So anybody who's involved in any form of fisheries ought to get quite cross about that because it's there in the Agriculture Bill. It fails to confirm the UK's commitment to very significant environmental principles su such as a thing called maximum sustainable yield, which is a fundamental principle of how fisheries should be managed. It doesn't require policymakers to allocate funds. Some of the money in this is fisheries money that used to pay for nets, or still does at the moment, pay for nets that changes that would move to sustainable uh, um, production. Uh, other conservation measures like scientific stock assessments, transition to less damaging fishing gear, investment in marketing for sustainable fish, that kind of thing. And it doesn't address any big issues around fairness, around allocation of quota. So I just, I keep track of the fishing stuff, partly because I think it's a bit of a canary in the cage for what some of the thinking is under the surface of the ocean in this case, because fish is, you know, in, in critically important to our well-being, but it's also very much uh, full of problems around sustainability, environmental conservation, marine conservation. So we keep track of that because it hasn't had as much pressure in some ways as the agriculture bill, and it's therefore full of more holes. So I'm going to very quickly then move on to trade policy, and I'm not going to go into this on any, in any particular depth, partly because it's highly technical and not my specialism, absolutely underline that, but partly because so much of what we might still discuss is still in this bucket over here, uncertainty, at least until we know what kind of Brexit will or won't happen, deal, no deal, customs union, blah, blah, blah. But what's quite interesting is that when consulted for the first time properly by the Department for International Trade, 600,000 responses were received, uh, this was on trade deals and standards. The biggest concern everybody expressed, food standards, funnily enough. The, the, risk, the consultation on which country food standards were people most concerned about? America, of course, because Liam Fox, as I mentioned earlier, had started to say, oh, well, chlorine chicken, oh, well, hormone beef, it's all right, don't worry. Outcompete British farmers, doesn't really seem to matter. So a few points are worth making and are based more on opinions and reflections from the many twists and turns on trade policy. So much has been made by proponents of no deal, crashing out onto WTO rules and all that stuff, and people who are in, into the freest versions of free trade, of the idea of cheap food. And I was really chuffed that Michael Gove on this stage said cheap food is a way of destroying the planet because we push all the costs back onto producers and onto the planet and onto animals and onto antibiotics. And that's not the way we should be approaching um, making sure that people can eat well. The reason that people can't eat well in this country is largely to do with social policy, housing policy, housing costs, and all those things. It shouldn't, the cost of feeding people well who've got very low income should not be borne by farmers who are already struggling as well. So, would love to have more of that kind of conversation with you guys. 
But what's interesting in the trade deals is that modern trade negotiations are largely about standards. What standards are we prepared to champion or compromise on food safety? farming standards, pesticides, health, animal welfare, antibiotics, climate change. These are the sorts of things that need to turn up in trade deals. But unfortunately, Liam Fox has totally resisted the idea of those trade negotiations being transparent so that they could come to Parliament to be voted on or scrutinised. And this is terribly concerning. Modern trade deals are about standards, not just about how much um, food and uh, goods flow. And we haven't had to negotiate trade deals for decades. This is new territory. So any legislation that comes out around trade is terribly, terribly important because it will be about putting duties on our trade negotiators to, negotiators to come out and negotiate and find out what the public wants. US negotiators have a trade mandate. It's a pretty scary mandate, but it is actually there in public for people to see so that they know what we know what they're coming at us with. We don't need that to be behind closed doors. Kerry, coming to you, you've been dealing with all of this sort of stuff, all of it, on the front line of the parliamentary process. And I wonder if you might like to comment on some of this. So in relation to the agriculture bill, for example, and what you've heard from Vicky, what do you think the main opportunities are to amend that bill, to make it a firm foundation for sustainable food and farming? Where should we help? How should we focus our efforts? Okay, well, as, as Vicky said, um, and, and Vicky's been amazing, and, and Tom's been amazing in terms of um, supporting those of us on the bill committee, um, it's, it's qu actually quite difficult when the people on the other side to you are agreeing with everything you say, but they're just not quite agreeing to put anything in the bill. If they were standing up and arguing as, you know, for example, there was one of um, the Conservative backbenchers on the committee that argued against putting soil in there on the basis that his soil was better than it had ever been and there wasn't a problem with soil. You can argue against that. So but soil actually, conservation is not mentioned as a public good exclusively in the agriculture bill? Yeah, it's not mentioned the agriculture as bill. public good in the bill. We'd put in an amendment saying it should be specifically mentioned. Um, but it was only a backbencher that said, it's not important and my, my soil's great, thank you. In terms of the minister, George Eustace, he absolutely agreed with me um, that soil is really, really important. But he just said it's sort of covered and you, you, so, you would have assumed that it's, it's there within the other things mentioned in the bill. And that actually becomes far more difficult to argue about because you're not arguing on, you can't say, but soil's really damaged and we, you know, we've only got 30 to 40 years of harvest left or any of those arguments because he's agreeing with you on that. Um, it's just he doesn't want to put it in the bill. And I think it is partly, as, as the Secretary of State said earlier, that they, they want the bill to be as simple as possible because they don't want to open the floodgates to amendments. Um, but I don't really see why they can't have things like soil and agroecology and relatively uncontroversial things in there, where they, you know, there definitely is cross-party uh, agreement on, on those sort of issues. The, the controversial bit is on food production, um, where um, uh, Neil Parrish, the chair of the EPRA Select Committee, has put in amendments specifically calling for food production to be supported in the bill, which neither the um, government, nor um, or certainly not, not me or people, um, most people involved from the NGO point of view would support. So in terms of where there is possibility of getting amendments, I think we stand a better chance in the Lords just because the Lords is more independent minded. We've got, we have got, there will be a lot of Lords that aren't engaged, but we've got some really, um, really good people in the Lords, ranging from like Baroness Young, Lord Devon, um, Sue Miller, who co-chairs the agroecology group with me. There are some, there's some really good people there. And um, they will, as you say, particularly be interested in the constitutional points, so the idea that it gives powers rather than duties. So I think we can make some progress there. In terms of the Commons, um, I've got an amendment in on agroecology. The difficulty will be in that is, to be frank, um, and we have been having quite a few emails through, and I love getting those emails because they're saying, will you sign this amendment? And I can just go back and say, if you look at who tabled the amendment, <laughs> that's kind of me. So, so, you know, it's quite an easy one to reply to. But um, most MPs won't be that engaged. I mean, certainly agroecology has got a much higher profile in Parliament. The all-party group has been doing what it can to promote it amongst MPs. Um, but we will really rely on... Um, people emailing their MPs about the amendments to raise awareness of, of that. The one that I think has most chance, or certainly will be most controversial, and the government is probably most worried about, because actually if agroecology goes in, 
I don't think they'd be that bothered. I think it's just more like you say, they're just holding firm against anything. But on the trade deals, um, there is, I've, I've got a new clause one, which is basically saying no lowering of standards in post-Brexit trade deals. So it's not just no lowering of British standards, it's not allowing lower standard produce to come in undercutting British farmers. Neil Parrish has now put in one on behalf of the EFRA Select Committee. And that is good because it shows it's not just like the usual suspects on the green front. It is actually the traditional farming end of things as well. And I gather that when Michael was at the other conference down the road this morning, he was really pressed on this issue. So it is an alliance between um, basically anyone who doesn't want to see cheap substandard food come into this country, and that includes the NFU as well as the environmental groups. And there were Tory MPs that said during committee stage that although they wouldn't vote with me in committee stage, um, Simon Hall, for example, who's a Dorset MP, he said he would support it when it came to the floor of the House, and there were a few others that said that. He actually made a very good speech. So I think that one, and because you know, you've got everybody from the Daily Mail and so on, there's, there's, it's very easy to engage people's minds when you come to talking about things like chlorinated chicken, hormone pump beef, in a way that perhaps it's not so easy to do if you're talking about integrated pest management or carbon sequestration from soil. Tom obviously finds it all very fascinating. <laughs> but, but, um, so I, I think there is scope. We don't know, uh, yeah, the caveat to all of that is that um, we don't even know for certain, as far as I know, that the government is going to bring the meaningful vote back in the second week of January. All we know is that we've been told on the Wednesday, Thursday, and I think the Friday next week, we will start debating it again, because the debate was curtailed after a few days last time. But we haven't been given the parliamentary business for the following week. So it might be that I think it just depends on whether they think they can get a deal through, whether the vote is brought forward or whether there needs to be more trips to Brussels. So the report state, none, the government can't bring forward any controversial legislation um, until they've sorted out that deal. Um, just before Christmas, um, the, the Tory rebels, if you like, went on strike. Um, and didn't back some, the government on certain amendments to other legislation. If Labour had known, we'd probably put in loads and loads more amendments, but they basically just down tools. Um, and there's a real danger that if they were to do that on the agriculture bill, mm. there'd be a problem, which is why yeah. there's this backlog. Um, so, but, Can yeah, I ask you a question now about, um, I didn't put any elephants in the room this time because yeah. lots of the things seem to be now out and running in a way, but there is one big elephant in the room, which is HM Treasury. Yeah. So, you know, we're, we're being told that there's a very strong likelihood that this will just be put into a bucket marked productivity. Yeah. And we don't think all of this money for, from cap money will survive the process. How do we influence Treasury? It's really difficult. And I think um, EFRA's had battles with the Treasury on things like its waste and resources strategy as well. And they seem particularly resistant to the idea of targets because that sort of commits people to actually doing things, which then means that budgets have to be allocated to doing things. Um, it's, I suppose the question would be, I mean, I suppose the problem is, what are we actually asking the Treasury for? So if you're asking the Treasury to tax something or to give a specific pot of money, is, is the ask to commit to giving exactly the same amount to farming you know, in real terms as we currently do under current arrangements? You know, is that the ask? And then I suppose the question would be, when, where do you do that? Because do you do it as part of the spending? It's not really, you know, farming subsidies aren't really part of like the departmental allocations in the same way. And you don't really have that opportunity. You know, do you see what I mean? If the, if the Chancellor's bringing forward a budget, you can lobby for a uh, three pence cut in beer duty or something like that. That's quite easy to do. But when you're talking about future departmental spending plans in the long term, when they don't commit in the long term, that's quite difficult. So, so there was one amendment, again, which the EFRA committee is supporting cross-party basis um, on multi-annual budget, so a, a firm financial framework to give farmers a bit more certainty. But I think it's very difficult to get, they wouldn't, they'd be very likely to ever say that they're given a certain amount of money. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the spending I, review, I think, is, is due this coming year. So, yeah, there can be pressure then, but it's... That's not really the time scale. Spending review is three years. That's not really the time scale we're talking about in terms of. Yeah. You know, it's it's funny. Every payments. time I hear something like this, I think of that phrase "taking back control." It turns out taking back control is a quite messy, and that certain people go, "Ooh, nobody knows how this works, so I'll take control of it." 
uh, not necessarily always on our behalf, but sometimes. Yeah. So um, thank you again for all the efforts that you make in trying to get, get, let more of us be in control of this stuff. Um, I'm going to leave it there in terms of content, but I wanted to say that it, this is the time to make your views heard, to join in with e-actions, to make sure that the pressure is felt. Kerry listens, not everybody does, but they need to be seeing. The fact that Liam Fox felt it important to tweet a graphic saying, I do believe in food standards, absolutely. I never <laughs> said it was okay to eat joint chicken. That kind of thing, it, it comes from a real sensitivity to the mood that's in the nation. And the fact that in the 600,000 trade responses, trade consultation responses, food standards was the key element. I think we have to keep on making those voices heard. Obviously, that might have been a quite a narrow thought on food safety, but I think people do are concerned about provenance, about the future of British farming, about the environment, about birds. By whatever means we come into this, we must make sure that people hear. So, let me tell you some more ways to be able to dig down into this stuff in more detail, should you wish. At nine o'clock tomorrow morning, in the long room downstairs, the Soil Association are hosting with us the Green Brexit session, so that will look into the environmental stuff in more detail. The, food, the RSA's Food Farming and Countryside Commission are also doing a session tomorrow, and there's a session which I'm happy to be contributing to on the people's food policy. I'm pointing at Kay and Dee down there who are working. They don't only work on initials. That is actually their names. Um, also, I'd say please keep in touch. Again, we're not trying to market to anybody. We are trying to make sure that there are opportunities for you to be involved. So if you would like to give us email addresses, I promise to use them only for the purposes of trying to keep people informed, get people involved, say where there are opportunities to influence. Um, so Vicky runs a very good list to keep stuff going, as does Greener UK, as does Wildlife and Countryside Link. We will circulate summaries of this kind of stuff, and please do come back to us with questions, um, because it, it, as this emerges, it gets more complicated rather than less. But we mustn't let that complexity mean that we are paralyzed into not doing things. I can sometimes hear people saying, well, let's see how it all turns out. It will turn out badly if we don't get involved in shaping it. And that's been proven already. There wouldn't be a fair dealing obligation in the Agriculture Bill if it wasn't for Vicky's efforts with loads of our sustain members who care about the future of farming and whether or not farmers get a fair deal. There, there wouldn't be the public money for public goods process going on unless environmental organisations and farmers had talked about conservation measures so that Michael Gove had space within which to do this stuff. So please, 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 I'll say it again, get involved. And thank you so much, and see you again at another session. Thank you very much. Thank you.